It was 1991, and just one day, the first chapter of Game of Thrones came to me. The scene where they find the direwolf pups in the, in the summer snows. That scene came to me, and I wrote it in like three days. It just poured out of me. I knew they were the summer snows, so this was a place where it snowed even in summer. So what could result that? And, you know, wheels started turning. How would, what kind of world would have that? Where did these people live? I, I've known writers who have tried to write for the audience or for publishers or for trends. And instead of just writing the kind of stories they really want to write, the stories that, uh, that excite them, that interest them, the stories that they lose themselves in. If any writer is going to write about war, then I want him to treat war honestly. So it irritates me when I, when I, I'm watching a movie and or reading a book and the hero is going through incredible dangers, him and his six buddies, and none of them die. You know, Valar Magulis, all men must die. Um, I think it's part of life and, and art needs to reflect life. I think another thing I noticed is um, you find just one thing that a character loves or that they hold dear, and then you find the most brutal way to rip it away from them. Do I do that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I think you, you know, you, you have to take your characters and you have to put them through crises. That's what, that's what fiction and, and drama is all about, is, is not, uh, you know, your, your hero has a really good time, uh, but uh, <laughs> um, things have to happen that cause the characters to, to question who they are and what their place in the world is and what the meaning of it all is, to, to go through the dark nights of the soul and, and times of, uh, of fear and terror and uh, all of this. Uh, you know, I've always taken as my mantra the William Faulkner's words in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech where he said, uh, the human heart in conflict with itself is the only thing worth writing about. Um, I think that's true of all fiction, of, of literary fiction, such as Faulkner wrote, but also of science fiction and fantasy and historical novels and uh, nurse novels and whatever. I mean, if you, have, if you have real characters grappling with real problems, the human heart in conflict with itself, doesn't matter if it's in a castle or a spaceship or whatever, if you have that, then, then you have power, and if you don't, then you don't. And, and uh, Jamie losing a hand, losing the, the very thing that he defined himself mm. on is, is uh, crucial to, uh, I, I, I think, uh, where I want to go with the character. And he questions, what do, you, what do you make of yourself after you've lost that? And of course, I have Tyrion now going through similar things. I mean. He's always focused on the things that he, uh, he did not have, like his father's respect or admiration or, you know, perhaps women didn't look on him the way he would have liked them to look on him and all of that stuff. But in the aftermath of the events of uh, the recent books, he's now realizing the things that he did have that he's now lost, like mm. the Lannister name and a vast fortune in gold that could allow him to, to buy and sell anything. Yeah, I, I just have to echo what everyone else says here. I mean, you, ultimately, you write for yourself. Um, I, I've known writers who have tried to write for the audience or for publishers or for trends, and I've seen them spend years and decades running from one trend to another to try to be successful. Oh, some, you know, I'll write some science fiction, I'll write some cyberpunk. Cyberpunk's very hot. Oh, now I'll write steampunk, because everybody likes steampunk. Oh, oh wait a minute, I'm, epic fantasy is catching on. I'll write that, oh no, urban fantasy. And they keep switching genres, trying to hook on to something, instead of just writing the kind of stories they really want to write, the stories that, uh, uh, that excite them, that interest them, the stories that they lose themselves in. Um, and, you know, Pat was right about obsessions, too. I mean, um, for me, one of the things about the Middle Ages that I love is heraldry. And uh, there's a lot of stuff in my book about all the heraldry of the various houses. And uh, I love it. I devote a lot of time to it. Um, I also devote a lot of time to, to feasts, for some reason. I, I, I seem to have... Uh, <laughs> A certain attraction to food. I haven't, I haven't noticed. And and some of my readers uh, don't like that. They go, oh, it's 
gratuitous. Uh, gratuitous eating? Gratuitous eating. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't advance the plot to know how well the swan was cooked. <laughs> and well, why do we know all this heraldry? Uh, it's too much. I'm not interested in heraldry. And, uh, you know, well, fine. Write your own book. Leave out the heraldry. I don't care. <laughs> this is my book. I'm going to put in the heraldry. And, <laughs> And we're not even going to get into the whole question of sex and uh, gratuitous sex. And can any sex really be gratuitous? I don't. <laughs> I don't think so. But no, you write the things that uh, that interest you. Uh, you know, and you use someone who was really interested in plate tectonics. I don't think I'd be lined up to buy that that fantasy about uh, a lot about plate tectonics. But if that's what you know floats his boat, hey, maybe he'll make me interested in it. Do you like killing your characters? No, I don't. Then but why I, do you do I, it so do, much, George? I, I do think it needs to be done. <laughs> Big fan of death up there, okay. Um. Well, you know, Valar Mogulis, all men must die. Um, I think it's part of life, and, and art needs to reflect life. Um, Particularly if you're, if you're writing a fantasy novel, an epic fantasy novel, certainly since the days of Tolkien, uh, so many fantasy novels have uh, been about war. If any writer is going to write about war, then I want him to treat war honestly. And one thing I, I know about war from people who served in Vietnam and, and served in other wars is, uh, you know, it, it does bring out the beast in men and anybody can die. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're the hero. I think everybody who died in any war th thought they were the hero right to the moment that the bullet blew off the top of their skull. Um, so it irritates me when, I, when I, I'm watching a movie and or reading a book and the hero is going through incredible dangers, him and his six buddies, and none of them die. You know, maybe one of them gets wounded at some point, uh, but they, they all survive pretty much untouched at the end. I mean, and Tolkien, uh, which I read when I was young and, and at a pretty formative age, I think. That book had an immense influence on me. And it does have some powerful deaths in it. My God, I really don't know what's going to happen in this book. Anyone can die. And it became so much more exciting in that point because anyone could die. The peril was real. Mm. And that's the feeling I want my readers to have, that uh, <laughs> if you're going to Fear enter... is the feeling you want your readers to have. <laughs> yes, actually. In a, <laughs> In a word, if, you, if you're going to write about fearful situations, I want mm. you to have fear, and the right kind of fear. Do you remember what the original seed of the idea was? It was 1991. Uh, I was actually writing another novel. I was writing a science fiction novel that I'd been intending to write for some time. And just one day, the first chapter of Game of Thrones came to me. The scene where they find the direwolf pups in the, in the summer snows. That was the first scene that you wrote? That was the first scene that I wrote, yeah. That scene came to me and I wrote it in like three days. It just poured out of me. What about it struck you? It, it was a scene that haunted me. Uh, the characters seemed so real. I knew right from the beginning, I mean that first sentence, they find the direwolf pups in the summer snows. I knew they were the summer snows. So this was a place where it snowed even in summer. So what could result that? And you know, wheels started turning. How would what kind of world would have that? Where do these people live? What is the rest of the kingdom like? And the the world building grew parallel to the story. You know, I'm I'm writing a story and someone makes a reference to some king who's been dead a hundred years. And I threw a few of those in, and then I said, I better write a list of all these kings or I'm going to start contradicting myself. So I wrote a list of the Targaryen kings and the names of their reigns. At some point, I said, I better have a map. So I sat down and I drew a map, all while I was still writing the story. There is a lot of description of the saloon and inside of the steamboat, of the way to live on the boat. So you wrote a lot. <laughs> well, it's, you know, helps the period come alive. My, my goal as a writer is always to immerse my readers in, in the scenes that they're writing about, to make them feel 
almost as if they they were living those scenes rather than there, rather than just reading about them. So I, I tend to, uh, you know, the, the old writer's maxim show, don't tell. I, I want to show, I want to put my reader in there. I want them to taste the food and, and see the sights the protagonist is seeing and hear the words that they're, that they're doing. And uh, I can't say I always succeed in that, but that's certainly my goal in the vast majority of things that I write. I think it'd be fair to say, based on what you just said, that you don't write to a plan. The, the writing more just, you know, grabs you and, and you just sort of chase it. Uh, yes and no. I, I mean, I, I do know where I'm going. I, I uh, know where the story ends. I know the fate of the principal characters. No, I'm not going to tell any of you. <laughs> um, but there is a considerable amount that you discover in the process of writing. Um, that's the fun of writing, actually. Uh, I've talked about, uh, in, in many other interviews, about the two kinds of writers, the, the gardener and the architect. You know, the, the architect uh, is like an architect planning a building when he plans a novel. He, he knows how many stories it's going to be and how many windows it's going to have and how it's going to be heated and what the roof is made of and where the plugs are going to be in each wall and et cetera, et cetera. And he works all of that out and blueprints all of that or outlines it in the case of a novel before he drives the first nail or writes the first sentence. Um, the gardener digs a hole and throws in a seed and sort of waters it with his blood and hopes <laughs> that uh, something interesting comes out. Now, you know, mind you, the gardener knows certain things. The gardener knows whether he plant, planted a, a potato or a geranium. But, uh, and it would be very surprising if you plant a potato and a germanium comes up. But uh, a lot is discovered in the, in the process. I, I think all writers are some combination of these two, but they, they tend, according to your personality, to one side or another. And I'm much more on the gardener side. I am, you know, I think like 90% gardener. As were somebody like J.R.R. Tolkien, who, uh, you know, one of my literary idols who uh, started out writing Lord of the Rings as a sequel to The Hobbit, and uh, it grew considerably. The tale grew in the telling, as he said, as mine has. And uh, they want to know if you have any tips on how to write better dialogue, and if you have like uh, some authors that are favorites. Um, with just dialogue. Yeah, writing. writing dialogue is something that Hollywood really helps me with. You know, when you, when you write a script, uh, it has a different format. Uh, it's easily researched, if any of you are interested, just by a, uh, any good reference book on screenwriting, and you'll see the, uh, the format. And the dialogue is presented in blocks with much narrower margins. And an experienced screenwriter, as I discovered when I went to Hollywood in, in 85 and 86 to work on Twilight Zone, they don't even read the dialogue, they just look through. And if they see large blocks of dialogue, someone giving a long speech, they know it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. This is not Shakespeare where we want characters delivering soliloquies for two pages. They want to see short dialogue, a line or two, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that's the kind of dialogue that uh, tends to work. The other key to dialogue is uh, reading it aloud. So I, like, I'm about to give a reading, I'll, I'll be doing that here. Um, when you read your work aloud, you, you, you hear the speeches that work, the speeches that don't work, you can get a good feeling for that. So something sometimes looks good on a page, but you actually try to deliver the line and it, it stumbles. It's because your work is so complex and intricate, both of you, that I, you know, uh, wondered how it could ever be adapted in other media. I'm wondering if there are things you wish that they had been able to include that they didn't, or are there are things you particularly like, on the other hand, about the way it's been adapted. Um, yes, I mean, for most part, Game of Thrones is a magnificent adaptation of uh, A Song of Ice and Fire. Mm. Um, but just the nature of transiting from one medium to another, uh, things have to be cut out. I mean, we have 10 episode seasons for everything we've done so far. That's 10 hours. You look at my books, you can't get everything in in 10 hours. Yeah. If, you, if you tried to do it literally <laughs> and included every line of dialogue and every character, you, you'd be talking 30 hours a season. Now, that being said, I would have liked, and I've said right from the beginning, that I would have liked a, a few more hours 
per season. Um, some of the other HBO, sh HBO shows that went before us, like The Sopranos and The Deadwood, they had 13 episode seasons. So they had three more hours. If we'd had just three more hours a season, we could have included some of the material that was cut, uh, particularly some of the smaller character scenes that I think would have deepened and enriched the experience. But our show was simply too big. It was already one of the most expensive things HBO did. It was very complex. It's, it's not a show like The Sopranos that you shoot entirely in northern New Jersey. Um, we, we have five crews on some cases that are shooting in, in Belfast in Northern Ireland, in Morocco, in Croatia, in Spain, in Iceland. Um, it's a huge undertaking, and David Benioff and Dan Weiss, the, the showrunners and the guy who, the, who did most of the work of translating from one meeting to another, said to me, at a certain point when we were debating this, Georgia, if we had, if we had 13 episodes per season, it would kill us. <laughs> and I like David and Dan, and I don't want them to die, so uh, <laughs> I stopped saying that we needed 13, but 13 episodes per season would have been, would have been good. You're always going to lose things um, in that process. Um, even, um, I mean, my novels are gigantic, but even a novel that is not gigantic, it's hard to get all of it into a, a movie or even a TV show. Uh, I had, before I made the deal with HBO, I had offers from people who wanted to, saw the success of Lord of the Rings with Peter Jackson and wanted to make mine into a feature film. And I had meetings with them, but I just sort of laughed. No, there's, there's no way you get all of my stuff into two and a half hours. Um, so. I'm very glad we chose the path we did. And yes, it had to be HBO. You can't put this on CBS. Uh, you know? <laughs> people, people would die. Uh, <laughs> you know, they would see a booby and ah! <laughs> so, uh, no, no, it has to be. <laughs> I think it's different for every writer. I mean, the one thing that's common for fiction writers, and I know in a crowd this size, there are probably a good number of you who are aspiring writers or people who, uh, who do write or think about writing someday. Um, it's, it's not a career for anyone who needs or values security. Um, it's a career for gamblers because, you know, you're, every time you write a book you're, you're throwing the dice again and you don't know whether uh, it, it's going to crash and burn or whether it's going to be a big success. Most books, of course, are somewhere in between. Um, it, it's a career of ups and downs, and I've been very fortunate. I've experienced far more ups than I have downs, but I have had a few downs and, uh, you know, dark times where I thought my career was over and I wasn't sure I was ever going to sell another book. What's important to me looking back on those is that even at the times where I was afraid I wasn't ever going to sell another book, I never doubted that I would write another book. Oh, that's, that's uh, okay. And that's the real mm -hmm. thing that I think distinguishes a real writer from, uh, from the false ones, that even if you can't sell the books, you're going to write them anyway because you've got these stories inside you that you want to tell. You have these stories inside you that, that have got to get out and you've got to get it down on paper. And, uh, you know, hopefully you do. Hopefully you persist. Um, but. It's a tough gig. Were there, were there things that you learned when you were writing you know, serial television that in, would inform your books later on? Uh, yeah, certainly. I mean, one of the, the structure of uh, Song of Ice and Fire with his viewpoint things and, and cutting between the viewpoints and all of them ending um, essentially with, I don't know, cliffhangers or interesting points is, is a structure I learned in television. Uh, you won't see it in my earlier novels, uh, um, but... Of course, working for network television, you have to have act breaks. And depending on the structure of the show, is it a four-act four show? Is it four acts plus a teaser or five acts? Uh, or is it a teaser and a tag? You know, what have you. But you, you always have to go out on an act break before you go to the commercial. And it, it can be a cliffhanger. That's a good act break. It doesn't have to be. It can be just a, a, a twist point or a new revelation or a piece of information or... Um, you know, something is resolved, but you know, it's, it's, if you watch Law and Order, it's always the da 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 moment, you know, where right before the commercial, da 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 da, you know, oh my God, something has changed here. Um, and uh, 
the, the idea is to bring you back after the commercial, of course, but it's a good way to end a chapter or, or uh, an act. And sometimes it's pretty hard when you're designing your story to come up with those act breaks, but, uh, you know, that's why you get the big books. And it certainly works uh, in the books, too. I, I mean, I, it it's, keeps people reading. You know, they reach the end of the chapter, and, and they want to know what happens to that character because they're engrossed in Tyrion, but gosh, there's not another Tyrion chapter for a while yet. First, they have to read this Arya chapter or this Jon Snow chapter before they finally get back to Tyrion at those end. And by the time they finish the Arya chapter, there's kind of an act break there too, and that hopefully draws them back for the next one. So, yes.